Okay, this video is for beginners hypertension. It's to coach a person who's got hypertension and they want to learn about it so they can get a better outcome. The, what causes hypertension? What can you do to reduce your likelihood of having hypertension or improve your blood pressure? So the, mo the majority of Americans over 50 have hypertension. Uh, the main causes of hypertension are being fat, obesity. There's a lot of things that cause obesity. It's not just the food. Having a high dietary intake of sodium makes people fatter, especially having a high dietary intake of fat. Okay, that makes you fatter. Fat makes you fat. That's important. All this keto, paleo, carnivore, low carb stuff, that's a bunch of nonsense for chumps. The big food companies have to trick the chumps into staying fat and sick because that's how you make money off them. Give them lots of pills, um, etc. All right, uh, being sedentary increases the likelihood of being fat, having a lot of high stress because when your stress is high, you have high cortisol that tends to cause you to gain weight. Uh, stimulants like caffeine. Caffeine increases the exact same hormones as stress. Cortisol and catecholamines. Catecholamines are adrenaline and noradrenaline. Okay, sleep deprivation. When you don't sleep, same hormones go up. Cortisol and catecholamines, okay? Alcohol, drinking alcohol will make you fat. It just adds to becoming fat. It largely gets made into fat. Uh, smoking tobacco uh, has a tendency to cause hypertension as well. It's a stimulant. Stimulants uh, increase blood pressure. Okay, corticosteroid medications like for autoimmune disease. This, by the way, book right here is about Walter Kempner, MD. He is a real famous doc with the rice diet. He was out in Duke University in North Carolina in Durham. And basically, this lady right here, Barbara Newberg, is a doctor who worked with him. And she went around on rounds with him, so she really knows what happened. And, and basically, there was no good medicines for hypertension in those days, so patients from all over the world would fly into North Carolina to be put on the rice diet by Dr. Kempner. And he focused on lowering their dietary fat. Rice was the main staple of food. Rice has only 1% calories from fat. Okay, so he fed him rice, and he also dramatically lowered the sodium. Uh, he would pretty routinely lower sodium below 200 milligrams. you got to be careful when you start getting down to his amounts, like 150 and stuff, because, you know, that can be a little dangerous. Rarely, for some people, are sensitive. But if you just eat plant food and you don't put salt on it, you're fine. Okay, that should work uh, for just about... The vast, 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 vast majority of people. That's what all these ancient ancestral cultures do. Okay, this guy right here is Nathan Bryan. He's the most famous expert in the world for nitric oxide. We're going to talk about that. Him and uh, Carl Esselstyn, our, Caldwell Esselstyn, our friends. Esselstyn just put all his patients on a low-fat vegan diet with no oil, and he had incredibly good results. By far the best results of anyone in the world for prevention of coronary artery disease. So, you know, the same things that cause hypertension and diabetes also cause atherosclerosis, all right? And diabetes is strongly, strongly associated with hypertension. This is the book ever, best book ever written on the subject of hypertension. It's called The High Blood Pressure Solution. Uh, the author's name is Richard Moore. Richard Moore is an MD, PhD, devoted his whole life to studying hypertension, especially all the details of the ion pumps. It's a magnificent book. It's one of the, all three, these three books are all among the top you know, 30 uh, healthcare books ever written in the history of the world. Okay, this, by the way, is my book, Journey to Optimal Health, where I go into a lot of detail and kind of put it all together for diet and for ion pumps. Notice the sophisticated cover design there. Okay, a little bit about what is high blood pressure. You know, the top number is systolic. The bottom number is diastolic. Um, ideal blood pressure would be like less than 110 over 70 with the person feels good and has their normal energy level. Um, normal blood pressure, sometimes they'll call it 120 over 80. Um, you know, when a baby's born, they're about 90 over 60. And a lot of these uh, populations, they eat plant-based all their diet, all their life. They don't move much above this, you know, maybe 100 over 70 or something. I just got my blood pressure checked a couple weeks ago, and it was uh, 108 over 64. Uh, I'm 60 years old. I have no medical problems. I don't take any pills. Uh, let's see, what else we got to go here? Um, Pre-hypertension is when you're starting to get... You can define it in different ways. Let's say we'll define hypertension as 140 over 90 um, on three consecutive doctor visits. Uh, mild hypertension, moderate, severe. McDougall will sometimes use 160 as a threshold. And on his more recent lectures, I heard him using 150 um, systolic as a threshold and whether or not he would initiate medical therapy if the person had that repeated at home. Um, more severe hypertension. You start getting over 200, it's more dangerous. You're more at risk to have... Um, uh, intracranial hemorrhagic stroke or something, uh, but those are still rare. The big, a big hemorrhagic stroke is quite rare. Okay, little tiny microbleeds, you know, 
often in an older, potentially demented patient, are common. But I do sometimes see them from severe hypertension in patients as young as in their 40s. Okay. The bottom line is you want to get your hypertension under control with diet and lifestyle as fast as you can so you don't end up with cognitive impairment and all these other problems. Here's Dan Butner. He's a researcher with National Geographic. He looked up the five populations in the world where they had the highest percentage of people who were, you know, still physically fit, mentally sharp in their 90s and 100s. And these are the places. Um, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, Ikaria, Greece, Okinawa, Japan. And then the only one that's really a modern urban type place is Loma Linda in California. And the unique thing about Loma Linda is that's where they have the Seventh-day Adventists who are vegetarians because of their religion. You know, they're by Ellen White was like one of the co-founders of that that subgroup of Protestants and basically she recommended the vegetarian diet for all of them. So they're not health vegans, they're more philosophical, I guess you would call them religious vegans. So some of them still eat higher fat foods. Um, but one of the unique things about them is in terms of long-term longevity statistics, they have the longest lived people ever in the history of the world that's accurately documented and recorded, okay? The Okinawans used to have incredibly long-lived people, not quite as good as Loma Linda, but still extraordinarily good back when they used to eat a lot of sweet potatoes and other plant foods. Nowadays, though, the Okinawans have had a lot of fast food and westernized uh, food products coming into their area, so they're starting to get fat and sick like everybody else. Okay, so what did, what did Dan Butner find? He found that these uh, plant-based zones, they all ate 95% or more plant-based foods. Okinawa used to eat 96% or more plant-based foods. They all had a strong sense of family, of community, and they were all religious, okay? Those are things that make people healthy, stuff that you never hear talked about in the modern world. You're not allowed to talk about religion unless it's something stupid like meditation, okay? They were religious, okay? They believed in God, and they even had some form of like almost worshiped their ancestors in Okinawa. And I knew an Okinawa guy one time, a patient, and he told me, in Okinawa, you got to have respect for your parents. That's very much emphasized. You know, your parents worked hard to make life better for you. You should do what you can to help take care of them, and you should try to achieve more than your parents did. So they, there was a sense of responsibility to one's elders and ancestors in those communities. Um, Sardinia, they walked around a lot. Um, you know, a lot of these places got good sunshine, too. Sunshine gives you more vitamin D. They tend to be healthier. There's more uh, plant available where it's a warm climate okay okay this is just showing that you know it's such a better deal to go plant-based it's not even funny the american standard american diet real high in fat a moderate amount of oils moderate amount of sodium uh people who go this way they're screwed i just see terrible outcomes all day long every day people who've aged poorly tons of diabetes hypertension coronary artery disease dementia you know, like I said, most of the patients over 60 are, are cognitively slow in America if they eat the standard American diet. The East Asians, like the Japanese and the Koreans, etc., um, they were pretty healthy eating tons of white rice. What would get them into trouble is they would tend to have tons of sodium. They also often smoked a lot of cigarettes, like Japan in the 1960s, for example. But despite all that, because of the white rice and the vegetables and the fruits, they didn't have that much diabetes because they're low fat. That's what protected them from the diabetes. So their incidence of diabetes was quite low. Um, but they had a significant amount of strokes so they were hypertension from all that sodium and smoking cigarettes. Okay, South Asians, uh, people from India. And again, I've always thought of them as being real healthy, but a surprising number of them got significant major health problems because I think it's because they eat too much oil, too much fried food. Uh, so despite being really kind of lacto-vegetarians because they... Often will have some dairy products in the form of ghee butter, for example. But too much fried food is what gets them in trouble and predispose them to diabetes. And it's even not even regular type 2 diabetes. It's more of a type 1.5 because I think what's happening is that Tetsumori Yamashima, Japanese neuroscientist guy, is correct that they're predisposed to loss of the beta cells from lipid peroxidation of omega-6 cooking oils with the formation of toxic aldehydes like hydroxynonanol, which he pointed out uh, directly destroys... Um, pancreas beta cells okay um let's see what else then here you go low fat low sodium vegan diet okay they don't get hardly any if ever they're type 2 diabetes hypertension coronary artery disease and the uh very low in stroke very low risk of cancer and they're more likely to be cognitively intact so why wouldn't you want that okay just a little more epidemiology the reason all this epidemiology what i'm trying to do is See, lots of people come to me and they say it's impossible to tell what the truth is on the internet because they hear so much contradictory information about the paleo, keto, carnivore, low-carb 
you know, Atkins crowd. And what I'm trying to tell you is that's all BS. It's all nonsense and it's obvious. And the way you know it's obvious is just look at epidemiology. Mexicans um, were combined before 1848, the Tarahumara population in northern Mexico with the Pima. Um, then in the, after 1848, the Mexican-American War, they got separated, these populations. Tarahumara stayed in northern Mexico. They're in the Sierra Madre Mountains, Copper Canyon area. And they've kept their old ways. The Pima were absorbed into Arizona. They're now Americanized. They eat the standard American diet. They're fat and sick and um, tons of coronary artery disease, gallstones, all the westernized high-fat diet, low-fiber, high-sodium diseases. Okay, um, here's showing that red blood cells are a little bit bigger than a typical capillary. They're about, um, here, I'll, I'll I'll show this in here. I'll come here. So what happens is when this capillary wants to go through, let me make it this way. When it wants to go through here, it has to um, it has to deform, fold back on itself to go through. All right. So if the capillary is constricted, the small arteries are constricted because the high sodium is harder to get through. And if the um, if the red blood cell is stuck to fat because of rouleau formation, blood sludge, it's going to be harder to push it through. The capillary. So here's red blood cells stuck together by bridging molecules, which can be dietary fat, you know, the chylomicrons, um, the LDL cholesterol, that'll stick them together. Then it's harder to push them through the capillary because it's harder to push through, blood pressure has to go up. And if the capillary is narrowed, instead of being wide open, it's narrowed uh, because of sodium, for example, then pressure has to go up to pump it through. Okay, so. Now, here was a movie. I just showed a I put a link to it. I'll put a link below this talk as well, but I just showed it. Dr. Roy Swank, he's a neurologist out of Canada who later went to Oregon, did all the fantastic work on um, multiple sclerosis and how the rate of multiple sclerosis is dramatically increased in people who eat a lot of saturated fat. Um, he studied blood flow, like let's say, in the cheek pouches of hamsters, um, in the brains of hamsters, and then later on other people studied it in other locations in animals and in humans. In humans, they've especially studied it in the eye, also beneath the tongue sublingual, they study it. I'll put a link again to this video below here if you didn't see it already a moment ago, but you'll see how sluggish and slow blood flow becomes after a high-fat meal. Um, in the eyes, uh, Meyer Friedman and Ray Rosenman also showed what a disaster it was for blood flow in the eye. Okay. And the omega-6 are just as bad as the uh, saturated fat. Okay, this video right, this picture right here shows when you eat greens, the greens have nitrates in them. So nitrates are NO3. This is any type of salad green. Arugula has the most, but any, any type of salad green. And it goes in your mouth. The bacteria on the back of the tongue, they convert it to nitrite. That should be an I right here. I screwed up on the spelling, nitrite. And that goes to NO2. So... It's being reduced. And then when it goes in the stomach, the stomach acid converts it all the way to NO, single oxygen, nitric oxide. That's absorbed into your blood, has a systemic vasodilatory effect. can also travel some distance on a red blood cell. Okay, well, certain, ma certain mouthwash and toothpaste that kill the bacteria in the back of your tongue, they will prevent this conversion of nitrate to nitrite. So they'll lower your ability to get systemic um, uh, vasodilators. So what I'm trying to say is, Yes, <laughs> using a bad toothpaste will increase your risk of hypertension and subsequent atherosclerosis. So that is a relevant thing. Okay, and basically the whole idea was as long as you just sort of follow the SSN diet and you know also maybe watch your sodium a bit, you're going to live happily ever after. Your Johnson's going to work forever. Um, and in general, it's a lot easier to keep the heart function and the arteries working than the brain. I'm interested in the brain. Brain's more complicated. To keep your smarts, that takes more effort. Uh, but um, keep the coronaries working is pretty simple. I mean, just got to do the things I show you in this video. Just do them and you'll make it uh, almost for sure. Okay, so what are we showing here? Just basically, the higher the LDL cholesterol, which is especially increased by eating saturated fat, but also animal protein, the higher the blood viscosity, meaning the thicker the blood. So you're pumping a milkshake instead of pumping water, pressure has to go up. And this is the concept of the red blood cells having a zeta potential, a negative charge on their outer surface. Okay, and therefore they repel each other. They won't stick together because they're both negatively charged. So, you, you know, the RBCs are not going to stick together because they're negatively charged. But if you have a bridging molecule, something with a positive charge on it, that's big enough, like this glob of fat, the yellow thing will be fat, and let's say these green things are red blood cells, it'll stick them all together, and that's 
blood sludge, you can call it a Rouleau formation. So here's a bridging molecule, and that can be LDL cholesterol. That can be IgM antibodies with an acute infection. That can be fibrinogen, the clotting protein that's also increased with psychological stress. It's also increased with leaky gut. It also tends to precipitate when there's uh, bacteria get into the blood or the bacterial endotoxins, LPS, which occurs with anything that causes leaky gut, including high fat meals, like omega-6 oils, like saturated fat. Uric acid is increased by eating meat, also by eating, by eating a lot of high fructose corn syrup sweetener. That'll increase your uric acid as well. Okay, your ascending thoracic aorta is your second heart. It has a lot of elastic fibers that stretch outward when the heart when the heart contracts. Boom, the blood's pushed up in there. The elastic fibers stretch outward, and then during diastole, cardiac relaxation phase, those elastic fibers will recoil inward. Inward. That's called elastic recoil. Windcastle's like that thing you squeeze, like the blowers looks like a minute, like an, a triangular accordion. You squeeze on that to blow air onto the embers like to try to start a fire and they call it a wind kessel. So this is called the wind kessel effect. Okay, and the point being is you can't replace the elastic fibers in your ascending thoracic aorta after you have reached, you know, age of maturity, let's say 20 years of age. So you're kind of uh, screwed. If you're chronically hypertensive, you trash those fibers, they're not going to come back. And what that means is you're not going to be able to generate good diastolic flow. And because you can't generate good diastolic flow, systolic pressure has to go up. And systolic pressure going up has some bad consequences. Number one, when the heart muscle is contracted, when these muscles are contracting, you're not able to get blood into them very effectively because the muscles are compressed by the cardiac muscle contracting. You'll have blood flowing through the epicardial coronaries that are located on top of the muscle, but the intramuscular branches don't get much blood during cardiac systole, cardiac contraction. They get their blood during cardiac relaxation. But you see my point. If you raise the pressure of cardiac systole, cardiac contraction, you're going to have a more prolonged contraction. Less blood is going to get into these vessels. A higher pressure is going to go out faster. You're not going to have as much diastolic flow, so you're going to get decrease in your coronary artery perfusion. The prolonged contraction of the muscle means less time available to perfuse the cardiac muscle, so less cardiac perfusion. In addition, higher workload on the cardiac muscle, so it needs more oxygen and glucose delivery. You see the perfect storm happening here? More metabolic demand of the cardiac muscle, but less oxygen and glucose delivery available, okay? So you really don't want to trash this thing. And then also, when you're sending high-pressure blood up into your brain, the small vasculature of the brain is not used to chronic high blood pressure, and it's prone to being injured by it, and it'll scar, it'll form fibrosis on there, vascular smooth muscle hypertrophy, and all of those things make that intracranial um, cerebral arteries less nuanced, less able to increase or decrease their diameter, less able to increase or decrease their rate of oxygen and glucose delivery. And as they scar, you're going to have less ability to get oxygen across them, and a lot of times this is superimposed with simultaneous diabetes, you're not getting oxygen and glucose as much as you want to your brain cells. It's going to make you stupid. And the older we get, the more fragile we get. So you want to get your act together. Okay, here's just showing. Uh, you, know, you don't need this picture so much. So for this one right here, this is your normal blood pressure. Let's say, you know, 110 over 70. And here's a hypertensive patient, like 200 systolic over 110 diastolic. Okay, not good. Normal blood flow should be laminar, and what that means is you've got a parabolic uh, velocity profile with the red blood cells. It's like the side of your hand. Right in the center is the red blood cells. Right next to that is the white blood cells, and the plasma, like your thumbs, you know, is uh, runs right along the endothelial cells, the endothelial glycocalyx, the sugar coating of the endothelial cells, so to speak, in terms of the negative charges they're produced by, you know, the glycosaminoglycans and the heparin sulfates and the cholesterol sulfates and the sialic acids and all that. But the point that I'm making is normal, the blood flow looks like this, laminar velocity profile. When you've got real high blood pressure, we're going to see this will start banging into the median dividers at branch points and becoming turbulent. We'll see that in a moment here. Okay, so here's what I meant by laminar flow coming up. The common carotid artery hits the median divider between the external carotid artery and the internal carotid artery, bounces off of there. Now you've got turbulent flow. Some of it's backwards, retrograde flow. This turbulent retrograde flow, when it's present in ex excess amounts, it confuses the endothelial cells that line this arterial segment. And they'll tend to pull down their glycocalyx and express uh, prothrombotic molecules. 
and then the white blood cells and red blood cells will adhere to the endothelium. You'll form small blood clots. And normally we're pretty good at lysing those. There's always an ongoing uh, formation and removal of clot. But the older you get, the less able you're able to, get, able to keep removing it, the less endothelial precursor cells you have, the more the clot tends to grow. Atherosclerosis, by the way, is just a blood clot. Um, and then you're more likely to have a piece break off and embolize. That means uh, move through with the blood flow distally and then clot up an artery in the brain, occlude it, and cause a stroke. Okay, That's an important part. Atherosclerosis is a blood clot. If you're ever going to understand anything about atherosclerosis, you need to know that. And if you're going to tell me, oh, it's not in the conventional books, what I will tell you is the conventional books are stupid, okay? And I know this very well. I've studied it for over 25 years. Okay. Okay, here's your endothelial cells, what they look like. They um, are spindle-shaped along the long axis of the direction of blood flow. And again, they expect uh, normal laminar flow heading in the same direction as their long axis. When it's turbulent and retrograde, it confuses them. So normally the endothelial cells, here's an endothelial cell, lining cells of the artery, endo means inside. Um, they'll be making nitric oxide. It's the most important thing. The nitric oxide goes into the lumen, the center of the artery, and it causes, it helps prevent the platelets from clotting. So it's anti-clotting, anti-thrombotic. It goes backwards into the wall of the artery and goes to the vascular smooth muscles and gets them to dilate. So it keeps the artery open. Um, there's mechanoreceptors on the wall of the endothelial cells that sense the blood flow going by. When they sense normal blood flow, they're sort of like saying, stay wide open. Um, there's a little more to it than that with regard to oxygen delivery and the need of oxygen in the adjacent tissues. Okay, there's a couple other things they do. One of them is that their endothelial glycocalyx, uh, the so-called like coating on top of a, a cell, just like one has little uh, trees on top of a hill, also has a lot of heparin sulfates and antithrombin-3 here, AT3, that are antithrombotic. So the, it has a zeta potential with all those negative charges from the heparin sulfates, cholesterol sulfates, and sialic acids. The point is the red blood cells negatively charged and the endothelium is negatively charged, so they repel each other, and that's what you want. So you don't form unnecessary clots. But when you've got a lot of turbulent blood flow, from high blood pressure at bifurcations, you'll, form, you'll tend to get atherosclerosis. This is just the two basic patterns of atherosclerosis. There's a so-called Western pattern, which comes from eating a high-fat diet, and that especially uh, is prone to causing atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries of the heart and of the carotid artery bifurcation. It's a common carotid artery bifurcating into the external carotid that goes to the face and the internal carotid artery that goes to the brain. Uh, relatively pure hypertensive um, Atherosclerosis is more commonly seen like in the Japanese because uh, they were eating tons of sodium and smoking a lot of cigarettes. Okay, so they would get into cranial atherosclerotic stenosis. Stenosis just means narrowings. Okay, and then here's a guy, uh, Jack Delatore's theory of cognitive decline due to chronic cerebral hypoperfusion. He tied off the carotid artery in a mouse, and then he would notice middle age and older mice, two months later, they would be demented. And... Um, this is due to chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, chronic lack of blood supply to the brain, meaning chronic diminished glucose and oxygen delivery. And the neurons, they've got their baseline metabolic rate, let's say it's up here, and if they don't get enough oxygen and glucose, they'll just die. They'll go into programmed cell death, a gradual death. It's called apoptosis, whereby their inner contents are recycled. That's unlike a stroke. A stroke, you plug a, you plug a major artery and then everything dies suddenly. That all happens instantly. This is a gradual process due to just chronic undersupply of glucose and oxygen, lack of energy. Um, so basically, the point I'm saying is hypertension is the number one thing associated with strokes, okay? Yes, diabetes has a very high rate of stroke. Yes, atrial fibrillation has a very high rate of stroke. But the majority of uh, hypertension is strongly associated with strokes and diminished oxygen delivery to the brain. You're screwed either way with hypertension. Your pressure is way too high. You're at risk to have microbleeds and, and larger bleeds, hemorrhagic lacunar infarctions. Pressure is too low, like overtreated hypertension, then you don't get adequate perfusion of the brain. Plus that high blood pressure is going to be accompanied by high pulse pressure, meaning the gap between the systolic and the diastolic, and it's banging away hard at all these bifurcations. The little tiny vessels of the brain, they're not made for that high pressure, and they progressively get damaged, and they scar uh, with fibrotic tissue, collagen being laid down, fibrosis, scar tissue, and uh, it decreases their ability to deliver glucose and oxygen to the brain. Okay, magnesium's right here. It's located in the center of chlorophyll. So you eat your plants, you get your chlorophyll. You know, what more could you want? It's a good deal. What are the, so like the average standard American diet chump always says, oh, what about my calcium, my protein, my good fats? 
No, 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 no. Those things don't matter. Don't worry about them. You're going to get plenty of those things. What you need to worry about, the most common deficiencies in, the, in people who eat the Western diet is number one, potassium. It's a vasodilator. They eat tons of sodium. Vasoconstrictor causes hypertension. They don't get their potassium. Vasodilator. P for plants, P for potassium. Number two, they don't get enough magnesium. Also comes from plants. It's in the center of chlorophyll. It's also a vasodilator. It's also needed to run all these ion pumps of plasma membranes that you need. Number three, they don't get enough nitrates because they don't eat the greens. And you need the greens, you need those nitrates to make your nitric oxide. You know, Nathan Bryan uh, says that that's up to half of the nitric oxide you're going to make as you get when you start getting older, you know, in your older years. Okay, and they also don't get enough fiber. All those things come from plants. Here's just showing what magnesium does with regard to reactions that require ATP, and tons of reactions require ATP, including all your ion pumps for uh, sodium and your ion pumps for calcium. So magnesium has a 2 plus positive charge, and that enables it to stabilize the phosphates on ATP, adenosine triphosphate, because there's three phosphates, one, two, three. And so these phosphates want to pull away from each other because they're both negatively charged to repel each other, but the positive charge of the magnesium helps hold them in check. It's almost like holding two, you know, wild stallions so they don't run off. Okay, the Spartan diet is sort of my version of the diet because of my background of being a wrestler and because it's Spartan and it's simple. I mean, the only thing I cook is to boil water uh, for all the different starches, you know, for rice, beans, potatoes, quinoa, oatmeal, etc. Potatoes, sweet potatoes. Okay, and this is something, a little joke here. I'll take myself off here. You might want to print screen this one. It's kind of fun. Diet Nirvana Pyramid. So basically, the worst diet is, you know, junk food, processed food, and the paleo, keto, low carb. That's hell, hell for morons. It's basically, it's one of those things like if you're stupid enough to eat the paleo, keto, low carb diet, you know, do you deserve it? No, I wouldn't say anybody deserves it. But if you're stupid enough to eat that, that's what's going to happen to you. Because what people do is they look at some, you know, physically fit, good looking person, 40 something typically on the internet talking about this nonsense. And they go, well, gee, they look good. I'll just do what they do. But they don't understand. They probably don't really eat that diet. They're probably paid just to advertise it to keep you guys sick. You know, look, look at my videos. I get like 200 views for this video, okay? And it can save your life and save you millions of dollars in suffering and agony. And no one gives a rat's tail, okay? Because no one cares about the paroles. You guys don't have any money, okay? There's nothing you could do for a healthcare provider, really. You know, pocket change. Okay, whereas Big Pharma, man, they got billions of dollars, okay? Some doc helps them sell a drug, they can pay that guy a million dollars a year. All right, sad diet, standard American diet, you know, fat, sick, stupid, unattractive, untouchables, minimum wage proles, drink tap water, you know, dead prematurely. All right, then you got the pseudo-intellectual like Harvard faculty, you know, they'll recommend the Mediterranean diet. They'll tend to live about an extra 5, 10 years, but they're not that healthy. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, lacto oval pesco vegetarians, you know, they're a little bit better off still, but they really still don't know what they're doing. Philosophic vegans... They often eat very high, uh, high sodium diets, high fat diets. They're not that healthy. Uh, if you at least quit the processed food, another step up on the Nirvana pyramid. No sweets. Get a water filter. You want to get a water filter to reduce all your estrogenic exposure because those make you fat as well. No oils, not one drop. Avoid the sodium. Then you'll uh, start to make progress. You have to completely avoid it as best you can. Um, no nuts, seeds because they're fat, soy, avocados, bad news, avocados, never eat an avocado again the rest of your life would be my approach. Uh, and then or, here's the top of the pyramid, full nirvana, okay, organic only, fruits, veggies, and starches, those are the only things you need to eat. Okay, about the ion pumps, in the plasma membrane of a cell, let's say a neuron, you've got an electrochemical gradient, usually the voltage potential is about negative 65 millivolts and that's because you're pumping out three positive charges you're only pumping in two positive charges so you acquire a net negative charge inside the cell and you also have a gradient usually the gradient the amount of sodium outside is 10 times higher than the amount inside so sodium wants to come into the cell given a choice because it's moving towards a negative charge and it's a positive charge itself and it's 10 times more concentrated outside the cell than inside itself. Well, when a sodium is allowed to come into the cell, that can be coupled to pumping out calcium. This is called the NACA exchanger. Na for natrium, which means sodium in Latin, and ca for calcium. X is just a symbol of exchanger. And so this is primary active transport using ATP. This is secondary active transport because it's based on the gradient produced by this ATP. And that can pump out tons of calcium, which you need to do to get a vascular smooth muscle cell to relax. 
okay, this is just a reminder what I was talking about. There's 10 times more sodium outside the cell in the extracellular matrix than there is inside the cell, 140 to 14. With potassium, it's about the opposite. Okay, here's how a cell does its business. The cell has a resting membrane potential, let's say about negative 65 millivolts, so it's negatively charged in size, um, has a high amount of potassium inside the cell, low outside, and the opposite with sodium. So you help establish your gradient with this ATP pump, again, pumping more sodium out than potassium in to help maintain a negative charge inside. And then this is coupled with the NACA exchanger to pump calcium out. Calcium is a big deal because it's like the light switch in a cell. Calcium, when it comes up inside a cell, it makes the cell contract. So, you know, you, you want it there when you want the cell to contract, but you don't want it to stay inside the cell at high levels in the cytoplasm concentration because then the cell will remain contracted. And that's actually what happens in vascular smooth muscle cells. Because the people eat too much sodium, they dissipate this gradient. And whenever the more the body has to maintain fixed amounts of positively charged ions. So the more sodium you ingest, the more you will urinate out your potassium, and you're going to end up with dissipated gradients. So this NACA exchanger won't run so well, and you get chronically elevated calcium inside your vascular smooth muscle cells, and they're going to stay chronically contracted, causing hypertension. In Richard Moore's book about hypertension, he goes through all this in great detail. So here, to maintain osmolality, you know, the same number of charges inside and outside a cell and, and have them relatively fixed, you have to keep the overall amount of potassium per sodium constant. So if you eat tons of the sodium, and Americans eat, you know, way more than they should, let's say you only normally get about 200 to 500, call it 300, okay, milligrams, they're routinely eating, you know, let's say 7,000 or something. It's a lot of sodium. So they're dissipating this gradient because they're going to void out lots of their potassium, and then their ability of their plasma membranes to pump sodium, let's say, in their vascular smooth muscle cells, is not going to be so good. Uh, Richard Moore, who did all his lifelong research on these ion pumps in the plasma membranes of vascular smooth muscle cells, uh, said you have to eat at least five times more potassium than sodium. He calls it a K factor, the ratio of potassium to sodium, in order to have normal blood pressure. Um, so. Our ancestors probably ate about 25 to 1. So I would say you want to, you know, just eat plant foods. You don't need to think about it. You don't need to measure anything. Just eat plant foods and you'll get lots of potassium and you'll get hardly any sodium if you don't add any. Okay, here's just some paper about hypertension in blacks. Anybody who works in healthcare knows that blacks get tons and tons of hypertension and the related complications, including kidney failure, stroke, congestive heart failure. You're just walk into any dialysis unit, okay? And I used to do a lot of dialysis graft declots. You see tons and tons of black people in kidney failure from hypertension, okay? So anyways, that's a well-known thing. And so now I'm going to show you. Uh, oh, yeah, when I was in residency fellowship, you know, I was told, oh, well, there's nothing you could do. Blacks are just, you know, something genetic. They're salt sensitive, tons of hypertension. Um, but then you look at this paper here from 1929 in the Lancet Journal. Author's name is Donison. 1,800 consecutive admissions, no case of raised blood pressure. So 1,800 in a row with no hypertension. That's a pretty good sample set. And the point being is when they ate a plant-based diet, they didn't have problems with hypertension. Now they come to the West and they're eating hardly any plants, tons of meat, processed food. Okay, here's another uh, paper on hypertension and diet. They mentioned the Yanomami somewhere in here. The Yanomami from the Amazon jungle have no access to salt in their diet. Their salt intake is probably around 250 milligrams a day. Hypertension is non-existent in such societies. Do you hear that? Non-existent. There's no such thing as hypertension. Now, when you read a conventional medical book, it's going to be a stupid lie. It's all it's going to say, well, most hypertension is of unknown cause, about 90 to 95%, and therefore called essential hypertension or idiopathic hypertension. You know the joke. What does idiopathic mean? It means the doctor's an idiot and the patient's pathetic, okay? This is BS. This is bogus. All right, they've also shown you can induce hypertension in different types of primates by feeding them a high-fat, high-sodium diet, and you can reverse it when you take that diet away. Um, the, you know, a plant-based diet is going to have high potassium vasodilator, high magnesium vasodilator, high nitrates vasodilators. Um, it's going to be low in sodium, low in fat, so that's going to prevent hypertension. Oh, yeah, and Richard Moore said, you know, it's not the sodium. He says the blacks don't eat that much more sodium than anybody else. They even eat less, he thought, than some of these other populations that weren't hypertension. He said the reason why the blacks have such off-the-charts hypertension is because they eat next to nothing. They eat very, very, very low potassium. So what they need to do is eat more plant foods because that's where the potassium is. 
Okay, here's a Yanomamo in the Amazon, Amazon jungle, sort of straddling Venezuela and Brazil. Um, and again, they're eating like 200 milligrams a day of sodium, whereas so-called low salt diets, 2,000 milligrams. That's 10 times higher. And what's his name? Uh, Kempner said, you know, you got to get it down closer, you know, because as you start getting below 2,000, you keep going lower, you, you hit like a threshold point where you get a dramatic improvement in blood pressure. And lots of things in, in health and medicine run on these threshold concepts. Okay, now here's showing a capillary, let's say in the brain, and you've got um, you've got the red blood cells passing through this capillary here. Here's the entry point and the exit point of the capillary. The red blood cells are moving in this direction. They fold back on themselves because they're a little bigger than the capillary in diameter. These spindle-shaped spindle -shaped cells inside are the endothelial cells. And the point of the matter is as the red blood cells flow through here, they're delivering these little blue circles, which are oxygen that diffuses through the plasma, plasma membrane of the endothelial cells, through the vascular smooth muscle, and to the target tissues, if you will, the brain cells and neurons. Okay, well, what happens with diabetes? With diabetes, you get thickening of the plasma membrane here. This yellow uh, membrane here is the plasma membrane, and that lowers your ability to deliver oxygen to the tissues, to the brain cells and neurons. And then also you'll get hypertrophy of the smooth muscles in the wall, and you'll get fibrosis, uh, collagen tissue, scar tissue laid down from the hypertension. So all of these things, and hypertension and diabetes usually go together, they diminish your ability to deliver oxygen to the brain cells. So if you can't get enough oxygen and glucose delivered to the brain cells, they're prone to become stupid. And you, anybody that talks to diabetics knows they have amazingly poor cognitive function, especially after 60 years of age. And hypertensive also develop progressively uh, poor cognitive function. So again, here's the wall of an artery. Normally, the endothelial cells are connected by tight junctions. That's the lumen where the blood flows. And you have the endothelial cells. Then you've got these pericytes, and those are supporting cells on top of the blood-brain barrier. The basement membrane is located in between the endothelial cell and the pericyte. And when that becomes thickened, again, it's harder to get oxygen out into the tissues. Okay, here's making a pyramid for the Spartan diet, just basically keeping it simple here. First of all, there's all the things you do to be healthy in life. Try to maintain some good relationships with your family and friends. Uh, try to get some exercise every day and a couple times a week. Go a little more intensely. Get your sunshine as best you can. Get your sleep. Uh, it's good to be religious. People who are religious are much healthier. In the modern world, they're trying to get rid of religion because they want to bring back slavery, okay? But religion makes people a lot healthier. Once you go to atheistic Darwinism, you have no rights. So that's why they push that, okay? Um, there's only three foods you should eat. Starches, fruits, and veggies. And then you'll end up taking a B12 supplement. These are your starches. Potatoes, sweet potatoes, rice, beans, oatmeal, quinoa. And that's because basically when you eat a starch, it's basically a plant food that is a polymer of glucose wrapped in fiber. Your intestinal tract takes time. Well, first of all, it's low caloric density. It stretches your stomach, early satisfaction of hunger. Secondarily, as it passes through your gut, it takes time for the enzymes to peel off the fiber before the glucose can be absorbed. And as that glucose is absorbed gradually, you satisfy your hunger for a prolonged amount of time with the fewest number of calories. The net result is the people are skinny. Skinny and they'll have relatively good blood pressure. Okay, here's just one thing showing about uh, Finland. Finland was notorious for having lots of fat people with coronary artery disease. And they did something in a province there called Karelia. And when Karelia markedly reduce the amount of dietary uh, animal foods, and that means di reducing saturated fat, and they quit smoking cigarettes, and they stopped adding so much salt to their food. They taught their wives how to cook this way. They had a dramatic reduction in their mortality. It was a tremendous reduction, 84% reduction in cardiovascular mortality in Finland. And that, in the highest you goes 100%. That's an incredible improvement in health, okay? Okay, here's just another look at what the Spartan uh, vegan diet is all about. So basically, mostly most of your calories coming from starch, 50 to 90 percent of them. McDougal tends to push it towards the high side of this. I tend to, you know, go about you know 40 percent on my uh, calories from fruits. Um, so that's one part of your plate. Then here's your fruits. Um, and then here's your greens. Greens, you know, you get more nitrates, magnesium, for example. Got to filter your water. We'll talk about that more in just a little bit. Oh, here's an example of a plant food. Here's a sweet potato. Sweet potatoes, by the way, are probably the healthiest food in the whole world because they're low in fat, 1% of calories from fat. They're also low in protein, only about 4.5% uh, of calories from protein. So that's what you want, low 
fat, low protein. You want your calories coming primarily from complex carbohydrates. Look at this potassium ratio, 337 over um, 35 milligrams. So you're looking at about 10 to 1, all right? So that's going to give you good vasodilation. That's what you want. So sweet potatoes is a fantastic food. I think I actually heard McDougall say one time, if you haven't eaten only sweet potatoes for four months straight, you haven't tried everything from a nutritional point of view to heal a disease. Because, yeah, a person can eat just potatoes and be very healthy. Um, they're, you know, in the ground. They soak up all kinds of nutrients from the ground. Papua New Guinea, they would eat 93% of their calories from sweet potatoes and be quite healthy from that despite smoking a lot of cigarettes. Blueberries, again, look at this. 100 potassium for zero milligrams of sodium. So basically, it's in the ballpark of 100 to 1. Okay, that's a pretty high ratio. That's what I meant by our ancestors ate tons of uh, potassium relative to sodium. Okay, here's just some breakfast cereal. I quit eating cereal for this reason because they often would have tons of sodium and hardly any potassium. That's not a misprint, zero milligrams. Look at this. So you're in the opposite direction with a lot of these processed foods. Really high sodium, really low potassium. You don't want that. Plus, they're, they tend to be relatively low in fiber and low in magnesium. Okay, so those are some of the key points of the talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about estrogenic chemicals here. And so basically, you know, here's this lady and she's rather robust, isn't she? Those are good reasons. A woman has very good reasons why she needs estrogen to do all these secondary sex characteristics so she can have babies, all right? But take a look at this soy plant here. Does it have breasts? Does it have a Virginia? I don't think so. So why does it need such high soy? And my impression from my study of the subject is because it doesn't want to be eaten. Some plants, like let's say you have a berry, you know, the bear eats it and it walks down the you know a couple miles into the woods you know there's a bear poop in the woods yeah it does and then that can spread the seeds around and help the plant to grow but soy doesn't want to be eaten some other plants don't want to be eaten either so by giving lots of estrogens what are birth control pills estrogens uh it can lower the fertility the animal needs it soy is also goitrogenic and that can lower the fertility and the life duration of the animal that eats it so why do you think it's subsidized not because it's going to increase fertility quite the opposite i would expect Okay, here's cholesterol on this four-ring backbone. And right here is the A-ring, and it has a hydroxyl group coming up. This is cholesterol, sterol, sterol as in all, as an alcohol group. Uh, hydroxy group is also called an alcohol group. Okay, on the estrogenic hormones, it's a little different. Now you've got three double bonds in the A-ring, and that makes it uh, an aromatic ring or a benzene ring. And they'll resonate. They'll move around those double bonds. And it creates tremendous shelf life stability. The electrons can run around between all six of those carbons. You put a hydroxyl group on there, and now it's called a phenol, the combination of hydroxyl group and benzene ring. And that's a great preservative. Great shelf life stability from the benzene ring and great antimicrobial activity, antifungal activity, for example, from the hydroxyl group. And that's why it's in pretty much almost all the personal care products. When estrogen binds its receptor, what ends up happening is this hydroxyl group on the phenol ring, it forms a hydrogen bond with the active site of the estrogen receptor. So that's all it takes is to have this phenol group here and you'll get this reaction. And this is relevant because there's a lot of products like, for example, you want to talk about um, bisphenol A, BPA. Has, bis means two of something that are not in the same spot. So a phenol group, and there's two of them, so bisphenol means two phenol groups, okay? And then there's just something in the middle. So people found out there were tons and tons of health negative effects from bisphenol A, so they said it should be banned, it should be banned. The company seems so nice. They go, fine, we'll ban it. The reason is they knew it would be very easy to put something else in the middle. This is BPS, and you still have the phenol groups on both sides, so you're still going to have an estrogenic effect and similar toxicities. Okay, here's just showing uh, something about like birth control pills. Birth control pills are estrogenic. Estrogen is a steroid hormone that's a fat storage hormone because it tells the body when it's in high amounts, like with a pregnant woman, you're pregnant, you need to store more weight. That might be useful energy for the baby. Okay, so that's why also a lot of women, lot of women gain weight when they're on birth control pills. In addition, estrogenic chemicals often uh, can impair cognitive function. So you want to avoid them as best you can. A lot of men getting tons of estrogenic chemicals because it's in the tap water, it's in beer, it's in all the personal care products. If you eat a lot of meat, you'll get more estrogen, uh, higher blood estrogen levels. We'll talk about the reason why for that in a moment. So moobs are man boobs. 
the so-called beer belly looks like a pregnant female belly because the guy's estrogen overloaded. You know, the man boob is also called gynecomastia. Okay, the reason why meat and processed food lead to high estrogen levels is because they are very low in fiber. So you need fiber to keep your good gut bacteria. When you don't have fiber, you get the bad gut bacteria. Normally, estrogen in our body, when it's high, the liver excretes it, and the liver excretes it by conjugating it with glucuronic acid. Think of glucuronic acid as being like a glucose with a carboxylic acid on it. It's an oversimplification, but it works. Okay, so what ends up happening is then the estrogen is excreted into the bile, and then it travels through the gut, gets to the colon, and the bad gut bacteria, the ones from eating meat and processed food because of the lack of fiber, they have this enzyme in high amounts called glucuronidase, and they will cut this uh, conjugation. So the glucuronic acid removes, is removed from the estrogen. The estrogen then is reabsorbed into the blood, into our body. So what I'm saying is when you eat meat and processed food, you get bad gut bacteria and they have more of this enzyme glucuronidase, which deconjugates your liver excreted estrogen. So we will have higher estrogen levels. Okay. Normally we would defecate that conjugated estrogen out of our body to lower our estrogen levels. And so a lot of women, I see women where everyone in their family, every single female had to get a hysterectomy in her, in her 20s because of problems with fibroids. When, you know, why? Because they're eating a lot of meat and processed food and they're, uh, they don't filter their water. They drink tap water. And so there's a lot of, it's just too expensive for municipal water filtration to remove all the estrogenics, okay? And the other thing too is you'll see women, fat women walking around with a bottle of water and you ask them, why are you doing that? And they're like, oh, I'm trying to lose weight. Not a smart move because they're probably drinking tap water full of estrogenic chemicals and it's just going to make their body want to store more fat and predispose them to gaining weight, unfortunately. I've never seen a woman lose weight doing that. Okay, and you also want to avoid processed food for other reasons. For example, the um, high fructose corn syrup is made out of corn. Not, the GMO corn is typically sprayed with atrazine. Atrazine is a powerful estrogenic chemical. It... Um, causes male frogs to turn into female frogs. Here's some uh, gender confused frogs where the two, the male brothers are, you know, having SEX together. Uh, gender confusion problem there, it seems. And um, <clears throat> this is on your high fructose corn syrup. That's a sweetener for most of your processed food. The cheap protein for processed food usually comes from soy, which has got a lot of problems and it's bad for the testicles too. It's bad for the brain. And then the cheap uh, sugar usually comes from corn in the form of high fructose corn syrup. And the BT corn also can predispose to leaky gut. It's not good for your health, okay? I think there are real problems with non-organic food. This guy, by the way, Tyrone Hayes, smart black guy, he was out at Harvard, and he figured this out, okay? And, you know, so the guy deserves a big award, you know, maybe a Nobel Prize figuring out the effect of atrazine on hormones. So what do you think happened? Did he win a big award? No. <laughs> they tried to fire him. They tried to ruin his career. The, the big... Uh, food, pesticide, herbicide companies because atrazine is very profitable for them. They don't want the public to know how estrogenic it is, okay? And you'll notice, I'm sure it's just a coincidence, but, you know, placement of atrazine into the uh, food supply, uh, placement of uh, glyphosate in soy also subsidized. I'm sure it's a coincidence that all these things, and then uh, the F- in the tap water, also uh, all over the place municipal. I am sure it's just a coincidence that all these things uh, lead to lowered cognitive function and fertility. I'm, I'm sure that's just a coincidence. Okay, and then here's the other thing you see amongst nutrition, so-called nutrition experts. Um, and the, they'll sit there and they'll tell you, oh, soy is good. You know, they haven't read the papers, okay? Now, here's there was one paper here, and this lady, she's a nice lady, and she knows her surgery stuff, but I don't think she read her uh, her soy articles as carefully as she should have. She sat there and she goes, Oh, soy is not an endocrine-disrupting uh, food. It has no effect on thyroid function or estrogen levels. Yeah, right, or semen levels in men. B.S. Go back and read the papers before all the industry-funded stuff came out. And who wrote this paper? This guy right here and this guy right here. He's the head of the Soy Institute, okay? I wonder if he's biased. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, that's all I got. Um, I hope that was helpful for you. So the bottom line, if you yourself have hypertension, what do you want to do? You want to eat really low dietary fat, about as fat as you can. It's impossible to be too low in dietary fat. There's been people fed less than 1% fat, and they do pretty well. You just eat any type of selection of plant foods. You'll get plenty of fat. 
uh, you know, you'll probably end up where somewhere around seven to ten percent, five to ten percent would be fine. Okay, if you eat, um, even if those Papua New Guineas were eating ninety three percent of their calories from sweet potato, which only have one percent fat, and all those Asians that used to eat ninety percent of their calories from white rice, which only has one percent fat, they were fine. Okay. Um, as long as you eat a little bit of other stuff. You know, potatoes are great. They got all the nutrients you can want. Your starches should be the bulk of your calories. Um, and then eat some fruits, eat some vegetables, try to have a salad every day, and don't add salt to your food. That'll dramatically lower your sodium intake, dramatically lower your fat intake, and that'll help prevent hypertension. Manage your stress, get your sleep, avoid caffeine, avoid alcohol, tobacco, and all that. If you're already taking pills, then you got to do this with your doctor because you got to work with your doctor to titrate down your dosages. The medication dosages you're taking are probably going to significantly decrease when you eat this way. You don't want to be taking your old dosages when you change this diet because it might drop your pressure too low. If you're on diabetes diets, it might drop your sugar too low. If you're on blood thinners, it might change your appropriate dose of blood thinner. So you must work with your doctor. Please work with your doctor. I am not your doctor. I'm just an internet educator talker. This is for educational purposes only. Um, but if you do those things, you know, you've got a good chance to have some benefit. And if you want to watch additional videos, I've made some more detailed videos about sodium and about hypertension. Um, um, there's other good videos on the internet. Study like the results of Dr. Kempner and the rice diet. Those are quite impressive. Um, and, you know, study Esselstyn's diet to prevent atherosclerosis. Because Esselstyn's diet, the same thing that prevents atherosclerosis, really is quite good for preventing hypertension. So, anyways, hope that's helpful.